Good afternoon and welcome to our 19th annual exhibit of hydrogen fuel cell technology. We've been here since 1995 discussing this very innovative field of energy distribution and consumption. Uh, please feel free to have a drink. The drinks are on the house and to sit down and join us for our next 40 minute talk. We're going to have a podium discussion and uh, it's going to be very informative. It's on the status of the hydrogen and fuel cells industry in the United States. And to discuss this with me, we have Dr. Dimitrios Papagiriok, Gopoulos, who's the team leader of fuel cells at the Department of Energy in the United States. We have uh, Steve Shemansky, who's the ma manager of business development at Proton Onsite. We have Chip Baton, who is the president and CEO of Fuel Cell Energy Inc. And we have Zakiul Kabir, who's the chief technology officer of Clear Edge Power. Welcome guests. We're looking forward to seeing. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to Thanks, see Brian. You. Hello. Good to see you. Welcome, Thanks, Zaki. Wow. In the middle of all of this, I suppose, um, uh, Demetrius, if I may, uh, let's start with you're at the Department of Energy, and your job is really to have an overview of this uh, uh, fuel cell technology in the United States. Where are we now, and how good are things going? What is the status of um, uh, fuel cell and hydrogen technology in the States? Thanks, Brian, for uh, asking that. Um, I'm actually a team leader for fuel cells in the fuel cell technologies office, uh, which basically addresses technical and non-technical issues to enable the widespread commercialization of uh, fuel cell technologies and hydrogen um, in diverse sectors of the economy. So uh, we fund and support activities in these areas. And what is really interesting is we're also gauging progress with time. So uh, taxpayers' money, uh, the DOE support, has led to great progress in this area. And I'll name some examples. Uh, for fuel cells, for instance, we've been tracking the cost of fuel cells for transportation applications. And we've seen that um, we are on track to meet our uh, technical targets. We're targeting $30 per kilowatt at high volume production. We're currently at 47 that's a 35% improvement. Um, we've seen a 35% cost and reduction since 2008 and uh, more than 80% since 2002. Um, and that's due to the uh, innovation that's been achieved in the U.S. in various areas, uh, uh, in catalysis, for instance, and membrane development. Um, and then in terms of hydrogen, we're also seeing a lot of progress out there. And one example is, for instance, looking at electrolyzer stacks, we've seen uh, more than 60% uh, reduction in the cost of the stack alone. Mm -hmm. Now, some people would say, of course, because hydrogen is only an energy carrier, why do we want to go to the exotic energy carrier? Um, there is a grid uh, relatively stable in both our countries, if we're in Europe or in the United States. Uh, but as we were preparing for this talk, um, I discovered that uh, a few of our colleagues here had uh, power on the grid uh, when the hurricane was knocking everything else out. So, I mean, you offer already um, optimal backup power systems and power systems. Perhaps, Chip, you could say a little bit about the um, approach to decentralized energy production um, and offering power even when everyone else is down. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I think, Brian, you were referring to if you have disasters, uh, um, you know, what is the reliability of the grid? Uh, relative to the U.S., as uh, many of you know, we've had a few of our share of disasters this year. And as you move into distributed generation, a kind of a secondary effect of, of distributed generation is perhaps reliance on the natural gas grid more intensely than the electrical grid. So in fact, uh, both of us here uh, are in the stationary uh, fuel cell business. When we apply the fuel cells to different customer sites or utility substations, uh, the, you, as long as you have the natural gas continuance, if you have an event, uh, you basically can supply the power to that node or to that particular customer. So, you know, we try to put that in the value proposition that we, we, uh, we create, but it really is a function or a benefit of having a distributed generation strategy and not being stranded by, uh, not that central generation is bad, but if you're reliant on central generation only and there is an event on the grid, then you do have a discontinuation of service. Would you like to add that, Zaki? Sure. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to point out is uh, when we talk about energy grid, 
the way we look at energy grid is we have two energy grids in parallel. The traditional energy grid being the electrical grid, but the secondary energy grid is the natural gas. And it turns out that, especially in the United States, um, even during disasters, the natural gas pump stations are backup power. So there's hardly ever a disaster where we completely lose both electricity and natural gas, which was the case during the last big storm in the Northeast Sandy. And we were fortunate that during that natural disaster, the natural gas grid was up and running. And our customers, to be precise, 23 um, units uh, of our pure cell model, 400 units, continued to run through the entire outage period. And our customers were able to take advantage of electricity and heat. And uh, in some instances where the fuel cells were installed in, let's say, in a local high school, uh, when people lost power, they were able to use the high school as a shelter and take advantage of the reliability of fuel cell systems. Let me just add here that the Americans added to their energy vocabulary next to the word sustainable, the word reliable. <laughs> that is very true. Uh, in terms of real reliability, um, it, there, there are two issues still with these uh, units. One is, of course, you're relying on natural gas to be reliable. Um, or uh, is this also a way to utilize other forms of renewable uh, gases? We have biogas. Uh, we have all sorts of ways of producing methane uh, through waste. Uh, so um, is this all adaptable to producing decentralized energy with renewable sources? Yeah, yeah, the answer to that is yes. I mean, if that's, we, our, our fuel cells can be powered by natural gas, a variety of biogases, uh, sewage plants, landfill gas, et cetera, et cetera. So you have the same issue, uh, Brian. In effect, instead of having the natural gas be the supply, you've got the digester. And as long as you can keep the digester at a certain level, mm -hmm. and you still got the sewage flowing to the plants and things like that, and the digester, you will have that supply of gas to basically do the same thing and hopefully have the essential services within that facility maintained in the event of that. Mm -hmm. And that has been demonstrated, by the way, uh, down in Southern California, world's right. first facility. Right. Whenever we think of the hydrogen economy, if we ever get there, or even using hydrogen um, in larger quantities, uh, for example, for automotion, uh, for the automobile industry, uh, we have the big issue of uh, the supply. Uh, we can reform other existing gases, or we can produce um, in a decentralized manner or a centralized manner um, hydrogen. Now you, Steve, um, uh, you're a big fan of the decentralized production of hydrogen. Uh, what's involved there, and where is it going? Right, I mean, uh, Proton on site is uh, heavily involved in developing hydrogen infrastructure for transportation needs, and I think that when you look at what's been happening in the United States, uh, you know, most of the hydrogen activity that's been going on has been focused on transportation, and I think that uh, you know, looking at electrolysis uh, as a hydrogen source, uh, especially, you know, renewable, renewably derived hydrogen, you know, electrolysis is an enabler for that. And, you know, Proton has been uh, developing, uh, you know, the technology to the point where we can hit the kind of cost targets that the DOE is looking for in terms of, you know, cost per kilogram uh, of, of produced fuel. So, you know, a lot of the activity we've been focused on has been uh, deploying and demonstrating the capability of electrolysis and hydrogen fueling stations. And, uh, you know, it's been focused on targeted areas in the United States. Uh, you know, California is certainly going to be an early adopter market for fuel cell vehicles. And so we've been assisting in developing an infrastructure network in Southern California for that purpose. Uh, Hawaii is also kind of an interesting test case because it's a very limited geography that you can provide hydrogen infrastructure for with a relatively small number of stations. So we're actually involved in three hydrogen fueling stations on the island of Oahu that are supporting a network of uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, provided by GM 
and they're being tested by the Department of Defense, which is kind of interesting because the Department of Defense sees large-scale energy storage and particularly transportation fuel as a component of energy security. And energy security is something that's very important to our uh, military, and Hawaii seems like an ideal test case for that. When you look at this from a governmental perspective, of course, um, you have national interests on a large scale. Um, and some people would say, okay, there's an energy budget for a community here. Do we really want to invest in producing hydrogen uh, to fuel cars? Um, and uh, for us in Europe, we think of this differently because we have um, all sorts of peak production of power from uh, the wind generators, and we cannot absorb this electrical energy. We have to find a way to store it. And uh, one of the solutions that has been very popular this year has been electrolysis. This forces the hand, in a sense. That is, in certain areas um, in Europe, as perhaps in the United States, um, uh, you discover the uh, practicability of hydrogen by virtue of the landscape, the wind, and then you start to think, oh gee, this makes sense for uh, an infrastructure for automobiles. So um, uh, is something forcing the hand uh, in, in the United States towards hydrogen? Well, um, in principle, the DOE has invested and in, is investing in uh, developing hydrogen production and delivery technologies. We're not, you know, we're not putting up, setting up stations. Uh, we're not investing in that particular activity, but we are investing in the technology, and we've shown, you know, considerable progress. Um, Steve here also mentioned the fact that we have market-driven targets, and that we have a threshold of around two to four dollars per um, gasoline gallon equivalent, which is a kilogram of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we are looking, we're, we're taking a technology-neutral approach in how this uh, hydrogen is produced. As a transition um, means, uh, we've got natural gas. We, we can reform natural gas and produce hydrogen. Um, natural gas will eventually have a, an active role. It could lot follow renewable production of hydrogen as well to ensure that we don't have any intermittency issues. But you know, eventually, for hydrogen production, we'll be moving on to renewable sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I guess I'd like to say that um, you know, there's you know. You know, there has been a lot of, you know, kind of academic interest in renewable hydrogen in the United States. You know, but right now, there's really not the market pull for developing renewable hydrogen solutions in the United States. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the fact that uh, we don't have, um, you know, the, the same degree of uh, penetration of renewables on the grid that you have here. And you know, there's a good reason why you've got 11 or 12 electrolyzer companies represented here. It's because there really is a strong market pull for hydrogen energy storage solutions, and certainly you know, the electrolyzer is an enabling technology for that. So the market is, is quite a bit different uh, in the United States in terms of um, you know, the, the need for renewable hydrogen. Um, but again, the DOE has already you know, put in some good investment in terms of moving the technology in the direction that will enable us when, when that time comes where it's required that we'll be able to deliver on that. If and I may uh, add something yes, to that, um, even though um, the surplus renewable electron is still not a problem in the United States, by the way, that's a good problem to have. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> what our kind of technology allows us is we, we, I mean, generating hydrogen is one mitigation but we need to have a portfolio of solutions where we already add value with distributed power generation systems with pure cell model 400 type machines where we can follow the load. So utility, if they have a battery of our units, they can actually run load profiles such that you don't ever end up with situations where you have to generate some of this overcapacity and store it in the form of hydrogen. So if we could run the power generation which are possible in a smaller scale like a one megawatt or smaller type generation devices where you can do, or maybe even for uh, fuel cell energy systems, you can do the load following and reduce the dependence of generating this surplus hydrogen which then you have to store and trans transmit and uh, find point of use. Okay, if I can add to that, Brian. Um, you know, we have a pretty broad panel here, everything from hydrogen to more, you know, the supply side, which is the fuel cell yeah. side of this. Yeah. But if you look, I know this is a U.S.-centric kind of commentary, but if we kind of look at the, the world, 
um, and we look at the needs relative to energy and specifically, you know, how does it affect the environment? How reliable is it? What's the cost of it? Um, you know, the, the challenges of the opportunities in the U.S. are very different than that in Asia, very different than that in Europe, and even within Europe, there's differences. Yeah. So I think what a lot of us kind of concluded, or, or the Department of Energy is on board with this, is that, you know, whether you have solar, you have wind, you have hydrogen for, you know, supplementing the pipeline, whether you have fuel cells on renewable gas uh, or, or natural gas, you know, there is a portfolio here. You know, for example, in Germany specifically, Germany has a higher percentage right now of, you know, call it intermittent renewable fuels than, say, the U.S. Uh, a lot of the activity in that area in the U.S. is on the eastern and western coasts. Why? Because power prices are highest and they have some unique things, either environmental or po population density. So, you know, we're not saying that there's one answer for everything. I, I think the answer is that there's a portfolio that has to match to creating value it particularly where you are. And I think, you know, that's the name hydrogen and fuel cells. There's, you know, there's, we, we do work together in some places complement and some is maybe one solution's better than the other. Exactly, Chip. And uh, let, me, let me add here that we have a portfolio approach. We have all of the above approach within energy efficiency and renewable energy. We're looking at renewable energy sources. We're looking at uh, taking advantage of the abundant low cost gas, natural gas that's existing in the U.S., which is kind of different. To, to Europe, for instance, or, uh, or even Japan. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we, we have found that, you know, for stationary transportation, portable power applications, that portfolio approach gives us the, the, the biggest uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, those are already two issues, though. For instance, the way um, it, uh, the European energy economy works out is that often 70, 80% or more of one's home energy is natural gas. We do our heating, uh, we do our hot water with natural gas, and the electrical bill uh, in terms of kilowatt hours is low, although we pay a lot for electrical energy. Um, uh, so we do use a lot of natural gas here. Now here is the pertinent question, and I don't know how this plays out in the United States. Um, when we start thinking about using natural gas, and when that price starts to increase, or even before, if we think about CO2 reductions, already it's the case that you can drop CO2 output in the home uh, by 30 and more often I hear 50% simply by using a um, high temperature PEM cell or a PEM cell or even if you uh, do it in a larger scale, you could use your, your technology to create electrical energy and uh, combined heat and power. Um, so um, it's still natural gas, uh, but it's not the 100% hydrogen PEM cell approach to it. It's saying, let's get the optimum out of these gas. So how does that play out in the United States? Is there um, an interest in saying, even though we're using natural gas, let's get rid of the boiler? Well, first of all, it, we have a unique situation in the U.S. right now with the abundance of natural gas. You know, three years ago, we'd be having a different conversation yeah, yeah. when the price of gas was three times what it is today. Wow. But I think, Brian, one of the things you have to look at is it's not about today, it's about tomorrow. And this is many of the things that the That's DOE right. looks at. Because, you know, many of the questions I get today when I come to Germany is, well, if the U.S. started exporting gas, the price in Germany, the cost of gas would drop in Germany. There's a cost associated with that export as well. And, you know, how long is that price going to last in the U.S.? So I think you have to look long term. But I think fundamentally, if you look at some of the things that we're all doing, you know, the, the thing about fuel cells are, is, is they're efficient, number one. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, if you know that there's some finite life to something, regardless of the cost, why not take the opportunity to use it most efficiently, whether you have none or you have too much, right? Because the problem is, if your memory is short term, you know, you're going to make one decision as compared to long term. So, you know, we try to look at these things on, a, on an average basis and make those decisions, whether you're shutting down boilers because we can supply the heat in lieu of the boiler. When natural gas prices are low using fuel cells, that's good, right? Because that means that the total cost of power is lower. But due to the high efficiency, even when the price of gas is high, we play as a hedge against that because remember, we're making heat. Yeah, yeah, so sure. if you're not having the boiler, you offset the price of natural gas you would buy for the heating. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's kind of a general thing. I mean, Zaki may have some comments relative to the, you know, the residential or small commercial. Absolutely. Uh, Chip, thanks. Uh, 
to add to those uh, points, uh, I mean, the benefit of a CHP system or CCHP, which implies combined cooling, heating, and power, so our pure cell model 400 is considered a CCHP system as well. The bottom line is overall energy utilization efficiency. Every kilowatt of raw energy in the form of chemical energy, we have to be able to utilize as much as possible. And with CHP or CCHP type technologies, we can push the boundaries all the way up to 90% utilization efficiency. So it's almost like a hybrid vehicle approach. We are still dependent on the gasoline. Cars are still going to be on the road. But the first emphasis is how we can get more mileage. Mm -hmm. So technology like ours are pushing the equivalent of mileage on energy utilization by introducing both heating, cooling, and electrical. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think you know we still have market-driven targets there. We're driving or trying to drive costs down and drive durability up through innovation, and that will enable market penetration, will enable economies of scale, which will still you know, drive costs further down. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the most important thing to know about fuel cells um, is that they are inherently efficient, more efficient than the incumbent technology. Yeah. The fact that they're you know, more costly at this stage can be addressed through innovation, through uh, allowing um, market penetration of the technologies, you know, enabling those economies of scale. Mm -hmm. It's a very, you know, uh, there, there's a, a big advantage in going towards uh, the utilization of an efficient energy uh, of a power mm -hmm. energy distribution. Demetrius, can I just add to that? Because that's the critical point here. You know, any of the things we're talking about here are, are not technical challenges today. Now, certainly we could always do better. The number one issue here is, is having a value proposition that creates deployment or policy that, that does not d deter deployment. Because whether you're in, you know, anywhere in the world, the real objective here is to get wide-scale deployment. And even if you think about how big the, the energy space is, what, you know, huge volumes can come from small percentage changes in what we do, right? And the huge, to, to, to your point is, the cost comes down dramatically. That's the holy grail of this whole thing. And on top of that, you then, once that happens, you can actually attract private capital. So you can get away in the future of having to use incentive money and things like that to create behavior. So ultimately, that's where you want this whole thing to go. And that's, I think, you know, we're beyond the technical challenge. We're trying to say, how do you make this a deployment strategy around the world, part of this overall portfolio? Yeah, Brian, I, I just want to say that I think, you know, from the, de de the deployment standpoint, I think there's more of a national commitment to deployment here in Germany than I see in the United States. I mean, I, um, you know, I know Department of Energy has supported, um, uh, you know, market transformation activities where they have supported, um, you know, some, uh, you know, kind of pre-commercial buys of equipment, but I don't see the large-scale... Um, kind of national commitment to, you know, doing, you know, fueling station development, for example, that you see here, or some of the larger scale energy storage uh, demonstration projects that you see here. And I think that, um, you know, that is kind of a, a, an issue for, uh, you, know, you know, companies like ours that are, you know, looking to kind of grow in, in, in those types of uh, areas where you just don't have that deployment opportunity, which will then precipitate you know, real commercialization activity. Steve, just, you just touched upon the, the, the hydrogen infrastructure issue. Um, you know, I, I'd like to add that uh, I think the US is moving in the right direction. Um, H2USA, which is a private-public partnership, is being formed. And it includes the Department of Energy, other department, uh, departmental agencies, uh, states, and stakeholders and they want to address, through this partnership, uh, the, the hurdle of infrastructure and facilitating the uh, 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 deployment of fuel cells and through the creation of an infrastructure for hydrogen. Uh, there's another side to the integration of uh, fuel cell technology. I think we should return, by the way, to the uh, mobile applications. 
it's a very specific sort of um, application. Uh, but uh, the word decentralized is sometimes reinterpreted automatically here differently. Uh, namely, uh, if you start to shut down big nuclear reactors, you start to wonder whether a centralized grid with um, several gigawatts of power in one place really makes sense. Um, uh, we know that at certain points, um, the, the loss over the grid, even if you're using the electrical energy, gets over 30%. Um, and that's costly produced electrical energy that is not absorbed. Um, uh, and the logical answer to that is not to try and convert that into hydrogen. It's uh, actually to produce what you need when you need it and decentralize it. So um, uh, uh, we know this is an issue. There are certain countries within the European community that are really specializing in a decentralized grid. They have the intelligent grid. They have houses with their own PEM cells that talk to each other so that if I turn on all the stereos in my, I've got big stereos in my house, um, I borrow energy from my neighbor and toss it back when he needs it, and this is all integrated. So, um, uh, when we talk about decentralized, are you thinking in these terms in North America? Both of you operate possibilities for decentralized electrical energy production, added to that, of course, heat. Yeah. So, uh, is anything moving in that direction in the States? Yeah, l let me be a little provocative here. Since I'm not in the U.S., I probably can't get back in when I go home, but, um, <laughs> but, but what I would add to your comment is where. So, you know, we all talk about what's the strategy for energy. Um, I wonder how many people there really are at these meetings from the utility industry. Because I go around the world and I talk to different groups and I always ask the question and I generally get a small percentage of the crowd is from the utility industry. Because one of the things that also has to change is the flexibility in the operating model of the utilities. Truth be told, I started my career as an engineer in the largest fossil fuel power plant in the entire world at the time. Okay, so true, true, you can be reformed. Um, no pun no. intended. But, but seriously, so right now, a lot of the projects we do, we're determining where we put these projects. We've had discussions directly with some of the utilities that are starting to realize that we can provide a solution. And we're saying, talk to us, where do you need this to be put? Do you need it at substation A? because it's overloaded, rather than us doing a project that's going to take load off of an underutilized substation B. Or you put a ray of solar out at the end of the line, and that creates problems because you can only get so much power, right, and you're creating problems. Why not put, you know, a fuel cell or something there to supplement that in a base load? So I think, Brian, there has to be more of a dialogue on this because then it becomes more a question of efficient use of capital Right, and we solve the problem more holistically. So maybe I'm a realist, but we're having some of those dialogues <laughs> with the utilities that are starting to say now, hey, we, 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 we don't necessarily like what's happening to us, but let's put some of these projects in and kind of learn from this. And so far the results have been very good, and they go, yeah, it does solve a problem, otherwise we, didn't, we would have thrown money at it, and we didn't need to now. And from the government side, let me just say that, you know, we are looking, the government is looking at developing a smart grid. Right. And we are really focusing on uh, distributed generation as well. And, and you know, the, the department has acknowledged that fuel cells plays an important role in this respect. Yeah. Just add to, uh, just one second, I just wanted to add a comment to uh, one of Chip's uh, uh, aspects that he pointed out regarding distributed power generation. You worked in a power plant. No, okay. Unlike <laughs> Chip. <laughs> I had the rare privilege of working my entire career on fuel cells. So I have a slightly different perspective. And the way we look at distributed power generation with our Model 5, which is a 5 kilowatt CHP device, and our Model 400, is if we wanted to draw an analogy, this type of distributed power generation will do to the power infrastructure what mobile phones did to the telecommunication infrastructure. So. To put things in con context, in third world countries, there is still a significant size of population that still does not have access to electricity. And it is virtually impossible because of various reasons why there may not be an elaborate grid infrastructure in those remote areas for perhaps another 50 years if we followed the conventional approach. But with this type of distributed power generation system, and when we augment our power generation with biogas generation capabilities that is already available, we can leap forward 
and provide the modern lifestyle and the advantages of you know the uh, the civilized society that we live in into those remote pockets of civilization today much faster. Steve, you yourself focus on uh, decentralized production, so you're on the other end of the bargain here, basically, um, uh, and you talk about neighborhood or, or even family size units for the production of hydrogen. Um, is this geared towards facilitating the future of the automotive fuel cell industry? Are there how do you how did you develop and approach that technology? Well, I think the uh, you know small scale hydrogen production for um, transportation fuel we've always sort of viewed as a, a bridge uh, to uh, deployment of larger scale stations because. You know, we, we do understand that, you know, doing four-quart hydrogen fueling stations is very expensive. We have our own experience in doing that. But, you know, we feel that if you can make a small, um, low-cost hydrogen production device, you know, you potentially could have a home-based, um, you know, hydrogen source for cars that could help to bridge that uh, infrastructure barrier. Uh, so I think that, you know, that is something that we're looking at, but really I think, you know, when we come to this show and we see all the interest in, you know, megawatt scale electrolysis, really to us, we see that as really the, the, the path that we think is more viable commercially, and really it helps to create that bridge between the, the energy silos that we were just talking about earlier. We really think that being able to take renewable hydrogen and you know, help put that in you know, a natural gas grid really is a viable way to connect those two um, you know, energy grids. And so that's what's very exciting about being here is the opportunity to talk about that kind of vision because I don't really see that kind of discussion happening in the, in the United States. I think there's not as many near-term opportunities to do that kind of thing in our uh, energy markets right now. I should add that if there's questions from the audience, we have time to take a few, if there are any ambitious <laughs> people. Uh, certainly, I have uh, uh, some uh, general questions. We're all looking for uh, progress, and um, uh, uh, being on top of the research and the development, there has been progress, particularly since 2002, I heard in your talk yesterday, and since 2008. Where are the fields? where progress has been made, and where are the fields where progress is necessary uh, before we get serious about using fuel cells more often? So let me, let me just start off with mentioning the impact of DOE funding on the technology and what that has been. So first of all, looking at research and development, we've been able to achieve what I mentioned earlier, reduction in cost, um, enhancement in durability, but we're still not there. Uh, we want to make these technologies uh, viable. We want to make sure that they can clearly compete with the incumbent technologies and reap all the environmental benefits that we get out of it through enhanced efficiency, reliability. Um, and, in, and in principle, where we'll st we still need and we're continuing to focus on is lower cost, enhanced durability. Those are the two major barriers that we see in general. And that's kind of general across all the fuel cell technologies, and we are taking a technology neutral stance, uh, especially for stationary or portable power applications. For automotive applications, we're looking at uh, for a direct onboard hydrogen in a PEM fuel cell. So those are the two biggest challenges uh, that we are looking to address with innovative R&D. On the other hand, uh, we need to enable these economies of scale. So we have our market transformation activities. We're trying to open the market. We're looking at emerging markets. We, we see a stationary as a, a nearer rather than a longer term uh, application in comparison to the automotive application. And in addition to that, what we're also seeing is that taxpayers' money is really being successfully utilized. And we've been you know, uh, tracking and, and demonstrating that return of, on investment, if you may, from the stakeholders out there. Okay. Uh, Zaki, what do you think? Where do we have to go? What are the deficits in the development that still need to be overcome? Absolutely. I agree with your two main important roadblocks that uh, we have to overcome. One being cost, and the second is reliability. From technology developer like ourselves, we feel that we made reasonable progress on the reliability aspect of it. Uh, right now, we have uh, in particular, the stack technology, which historically has been the most uh, challenging technology with respect to durability and reliability point of view. 
we demonstrated that uh, this can be um, up to 90,000 hours, which is what we demonstrated as our single stack in a real world environment. So we feel that we have a pretty good handle on the reliability and durability aspect of it. We made progress on the cost side, but we still have ways to go, and for which we would depend on support from Department of Energy and in particular uh, pro programs like market transformation, which we have benefited from and we wanted to extend our thanks to DOE for supporting us in uh, some of those uh, market transformation projects, but we would continue to require those type of supports and from the Department of Energy. You'll Energy. agree with me that as a nation, we're pretty damn ambitious. Mm -hmm. So we'll pursue uh, uh, innovation uh, as far as it can, and can go. But it, just, to, um, just to add to what Zaki said, but I think the Department of Energy, for sure, we're, we're grateful for a lot of the funding that they provided at the R&D level. I think many of these technologies now are at the commercialization level. And, you know, I'll be a little provocative here, but, you know, these are probably not the funding. The funding commercialization is, is helpful from the DOE, but not really part of their purview going forward. I think, you know, it's not right now in parts of the world that we need more spending, okay? But we need probably more targeted spending on, on the right things at the right time. But there's a lot of inherent value or obstacles that if they were taken out of the way, Brian, okay, you know, we wouldn't need to throw more money at the problem, right? It would, you, you, could, you could put certainty into things, right? Um, you could, you could attr attract private capital. At Tazaki's point, yeah, it's all about volume right now. I mean, our cost came down in, in dollars from, you know, $10,000 a kilowatt to $3,000 a kilowatt. We need to get to $2,000 a kilowatt. We have a levelized cost of electricity that we track across the globe and say, how, what power cost can we produce compared to more traditional forms of electricity? And the answer is volume at this point. It's not a technology issue, and, and it's about funding, but not in the sense that's typically about just cash funding. Okay, it's about policy, constructing desire for private investment, I think is more than... Enablers, you mean enablers. enablers. Right. And, and I think it works in terms of the incentives that are out there. There are, you know, tax credits, there are subsidies that exist in the United States, which at some point will and should disappear right. as the technology has become, you know, viable. And uh, I think the department also has had, you know, activities through Recovery Act and through market transformation, looking and trying to enable the, those economies of scale. Yeah, I, I would agree with Chip. I mean, Department of Energy has done a great job at helping to uh, reduce and eliminate technical barriers, and I think we've achieved a lot of those. I think, you know, but, but it really isn't their job to address market barriers. And um, so I think, though, that, you know, market transformation activities is, is very important, and uh, we, we appreciate them supporting that. But I'm telling you, the technology is here, and it's ready, and, and you know, we need you know, support to kind of get it out there and prove what it can do. This has been a fascinating conversation. It's a real shame that we break it off now. Our time is even uh, long since passed. Uh, but uh, one summary that uh, uh, just the, the notion that had we had this conversation five or six years ago, we would be talking about one forklift truck that combines hydrogen with the battery and maybe one potential automobile. And here we're talking about literally how far we can take over the grid of a great nation, uh, how much of a role that will play, whether the automotive industry in certain sectors in the United States could be um, uh, uh, influenced under the influence, even captured by a hydrogen um, uh, transportation system. Let, let me so, correct you though, fuel cells and hydrogen will not take over the grid, they will no, participate in a portfolio Partici of technologies yeah. and as we said uh, warming up for this talk it, it will it will be playing a fundamental That's role um, the size is not determined but a fundamental role as part of that grid so we've moved far uh, in the past uh, five or six years um, continue the conversation please with these gentlemen they're all very highly informed so you can visit um, Zaki Kabir who's at um, um, uh, 
He's right around the corner at D76, D76 Clear Edge Power. Um, Chip Baton, who's uh, president and CEO, he's at B50, which is right over there. Um, Steve Shemansky, C70, um, uh, manager of business development at Proton Onsite. And of course, um, uh, Dr. Dimitrios Papa Georgopoulos um, uh, from the Department of Energy. It's been a pleasure to talk to all Thank of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Brian. Good job.